Good evening and welcome everyone to the 30th annual 4-H Tropicana Public Speaking Competition. My name is Bridget Alfonso. I am one of the 4-H Youth Development Agents here in Seminole County with the University of Florida IFAS Extension. I get the pleasure of presenting to you this evening our 14 finalists from Seminole County. A few friendly reminders to please silence all of your cell phones and electronics from making any noise. If you do need to use the restroom at all, please wait until in between speeches and be as quiet as possible. Um, the same with if you need to leave or step out, try to wait until in between speeches. We'd like to thank the teachers and principals and of course families and friends of the 14 finalists. And we could not present this great event to you um, on and on, over and over again, without the help of Seminole County Government Television, which films this event. And you can also um, watch it um, in the next couple of weeks on Seminole County Government Television. The 4-H Tropicana Public Speaking Program would not be possible without the support of Tropicana PepsiCo, their ongoing donation for over 30 years, of $30,000 worth of materials, awards, and certificates. This has allowed 3,922 youth in Seminole County to participate in the program this year. We had nine Seminole County middle schools and five private schools participate. You're going to be listening to 14 finalists out of 3,922. As I explained to them, 14 out of 3,922, they should be very proud of themselves already. I'd like to take a moment and introduce our judges. Judges, if you could please stand when I call your name. Mr. Joseph Abel, Director of Leisure Services. <laughs> Mrs. Kelly D. Christina, Administrative Assistant with Seminole County Extension. And Mr. Melvin Barnes with Information Technology Services, GIS Program Manager. And a very special and warm welcome to our school board members, if you wouldn't mind waving. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to our VIPs of this evening. The finalists are going to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. My name is Shreya, and I come from Markham Woods Middle School. And I would like to thank Ms. Lee and my parents for all their support. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tally Chamlin, and I'm from Lawton Childs Middle School. And I'd like to thank my language arts teacher, Mrs. Bell, and my family. Hello, my name is Sophie Golka, and I'd like to thank my parents and Mr. Shuey, my teacher. And I come from All Souls Catholic School. Hello, my name is Jaden Ward, and I attend Rock Lake Middle School. I'd like to thank my family and my teacher, Ms. Figueroa. Hello, my name is Ashton Fields. I come from Indian Trails Middle School. I'd like to thank my, my family, in particular, my brother Ethan, for helping me with my speech. Hi, my name is Amy Joachim, and I'm from Jackson Heights Middle School, and I'd like to thank my friend Hannah for misunderstanding a word. Hello, my name is Claire, and I come from Holy Cross Lutheran Academy, and I would like to thank my teacher, Ms. Casey, and my friends and family. Good evening, my name is Shelby Brunson. I would like to thank my parents and my teacher, Ms. Payne, Ms. and Ms. Dellinger, and I'm representing Teed Middle School. Hi, I'm Cameron Kelly, and I'm from Altamont Christian School, and I would love to thank my school administrators who were able to be here, and my parents and my grandparents. Hi, my name is Laurel Persley. I'm from the Master's Academy, and I'd like to thank my English teacher, Ms. Wilder, and my family. Hi, I'm Eli Garman from Millie Middle School, and I would like to thank my brother, Micah. Hello everyone, my name is Pranav Swaminathan and I'm proud to represent Sanford Middle in the 4-H Tropicana Speaking Competition. I am thankful to my parents and I am also thankful to Christina Roberto and all my teachers that have helped me come so far. Hi, I'm Dylan Bartley, I'm from South Seminole Middle School and I'd like to thank all of my family for coming here today and my very supportive language arts teacher, Ms. McAvoy. 
Hi, I'm Clarissa Avila, and I'd like to thank my parents, my friends, and my LA teacher, Dr. Van Gilder, for helping me get to where I am now. And I come from Double R Private School. OK, without further uh, ado, I invite you to sit back and enjoy your top 14 finalists. Our first speaker is Shreya Badanapoop from Markham Woods Middle School with the importance of higher education. Shreya? There are millions of Americans who could barely afford to live on their own and have to depend on minimum wage and government assistance programs. If these people were to have stayed in school and received a college degree, they could have gotten a job that would keep them financially stable. All our tax money could go to schools, the military, and other places other than to unschooled people. This is just an example. Let's discover more vital points on why higher education is essential. Education opens up a wider view of opportunities on what type of job you want. Do you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a low-paid worker? Well, if you want to get a job that gets a lucrative income, you must be well-educated. Companies look for diligent and qualified professionals to hire. They definitely don't want some slacker who lives in their parents' basement. That's for sure. The second benefit to your academics is that it makes the world a more peaceful place to live. It helps people realize the difference from right and from wrong, and it encourages them to make the right choices. It also doesn't lure people to do those prohibited acts, like robbing, for example, because, again, they have the capability of going out there and getting a job so they could earn the money themselves. Among dropouts between the ages of 16 and 24, incarceration rates, believe it or not, are 63 times greater than those of college graduates, according to a study by researchers at Northeastern University. If you stay in school, continue to get educated, you'll eventually find an area you're skilled at and may want to do for the rest of your life. You may not realize you're good at writing until you wrote your first paper, or that you're good at math until you got 100 on your algebra test. This shows that school is also a very crucial part of your life. Statistics also show how important your academics is. According to the United States Census Bureau, high school graduates make 1.5 times more money than a high school dropout. A person with a bachelor's degree makes three times more money than a high school dropout. This makes high school students think twice about dropping out of school. After learning how significant your academics is, encourage me to continue to stay in school and receive an education. All these points help you have a happy and successful life and rarely experience financial issues. So the next time you think education isn't important, think about your future and the future of our country. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. I had each of the 14 finalists share a little bit about themselves as I explained to them. It's their night to shine. So a little bit about Shreya. She likes to play volleyball, loves to hang out with her friends, and she loves to talk. That's a perfect fit for the speech competition. And Shreya is exactly right. Higher education is essential. Seminole County 4-H values secondary education and we hold annual fundraisers to raise funding for scholarships for high school juniors and seniors to attend the college of their choice. In 2014, we were able to provide over $3,800 in scholarships and hope to provide more this year. The 4-H Tropicana Public Speaking Program is just an example of the many youth development opportunities that we have to offer children 5 to 18 years of age with a program that focuses on head, heart, hands, and health. 4-H offers educational and career development opportunities that equip youth for the future. Our next speaker is Tally Chamlin from Lawton Childs Middle School with Sedentary versus Healthy. Tally? Fifty percent. That percentage is an amount of people. The amount of people who spend their lives indoors, who don't get to feel the rush of wind when they step out their front door. Those people simply don't go outside. They are living sedentary lives. They're also known as couch potatoes. 
Many people don't realize it, but living a sedentary life is a poor decision of how you choose to spend your time. You can end up with many diseases, and research shows that people who live a sedentary life can end up having a shorter lifespan. The top two risks of sedentary life include heart disease and type 2 diabetes. When you are living a sedentary life or are rarely being active, your heart becomes weaker. The weaker your heart gets, the lesser and lesser it can pump blood into your arteries. This problem can become major and turn into heart disease. Type 2 diabetes is spreading to all different age groups. And one factor is a sedentary life. Obesity, physical inactivity, and high fat diets are all risks of diabetes, things you can gain from a sedentary life. Scientists have also proven that living a sedentary life can affect your motor coordination. When you're being sedentary, you don't get enough practice with your motor coordination. Therefore, it will decrease over time. Sitting on the couch all day can only lead to one thing, too much green time. This can increase anxiety and is affecting mood swings. You could be happy one second and screaming your lungs out the next. As you can see, living a sedentary life is the wrong path to take. You could prevent yourself from these risks though by getting up and getting moving. It's really easy if you think about it. All you have to do is think of a way to get active. And there are many, trust me. First things first, you should exercise at least four to five times a week. Statistics show that you should be active at least 30 to 60 minutes a day if possible. One way is to build an obstacle course. Just grab some equipment, find open space, and build. It doesn't take much effort, and it's an exciting way to get active. Another option is grab some friends and family, play a game, start a hula hooping contest, and there are many more. It's not that hard, so get up and get moving. Now that you know why you should be healthy, you need to combine that knowledge with being happy. Being healthy is one of the key ingredients to your happiness. Logic tells us that if we don't get enough sleep, we'll be grumpy. Therefore, if we get at least eight to 10 hours of sleep, we'll be the opposite, happy. There's also another kind of health, mental health. Having friends is one way to improve that health. If our friends are always giving us compliments and we know they have our back, we'll feel good. Also, knowing that, our, that we're part of a group can improve our mental health a lot. As a final point, knowing that we will not get the diseases from a sedentary life will make us happy. Our life will be less stressful if we know the risks of being sedentary are not coming our way. So why is being sedentary a bad thing? It can lead to many diseases. That's why you need to get up and move your body. This simple action can lead to happiness inside and out. Now that you've gained the facts about living a sedentary life, you can make your final decision. Sedentary or healthy? Thank you, Tally. I hope the audience is listening. There's definitely some great advice this evening with higher education, health. I think these uh, sixth graders are going to be ruling the world pretty soon. Tally is a level three gymnast. Her favorite subject in school is PE, and she likes to go rock wall climbing. So I definitely think she's living by her own advice. I looked up what it meant to be a level three gymnast. And in order to be a level three gymnast, you must perform a steady one second handstand and headstand, a straight cartwheel with good form and a back bend. I'm still working on my cartwheel. <laughs> Our third speaker is Sophie Golka from All Souls Catholic School with a work of art. Does my hair look okay? Do my teeth look straight enough? Are my ears too big? These are questions all of us have asked friends, family, and even ourselves. I don't know about you, but the last time that I looked in the mirror, I thought God did a pretty darn good job. God made us the way we are for a reason, so why change? That's just the thing. Being you is okay and shouldn't hold you back from expressing what you feel and celebrating yourself. I think we can all admit there's that one thing we wish we could change about ourselves, but we should all be comfortable with what we look like and be glad that we're the only ones that look like ourselves. Who wants to live in a world where everyone looks the same? Who cares if your nose is crooked, your teeth aren't straight, or that your hair is just too curly? These are the things that make you, you. In 2013, doctors performed over 11 million cosmetic, surgical, and non-surgical procedures. That's more than $12 billion spent by people who think they need to change something about themselves. Some of the most popular surgeries included nose jobs, tummy tucks, and eyelid surgery. The point is, these people were created that way for a reason, which is to be different and special in their own way. And yet, they still elected to change that unique part about themselves. We aren't perfect, we make mistakes, 
We look different and even do things different. But at the end of the day, God loves us all the same. The 5% of people who are actually considered to be perfect by society standards may be gorgeous or handsome on the outside, but what about the inside? Your characteristics on the inside shine through all the makeup and surgery that covers up what you or what someone else may consider to be imperfections. What is beauty anyways? Have you ever heard the saying, beauty is only skin deep? What's on the interior is more important than what's on the exterior. Someone good looking may be nice to look at on the outside, but what makes them truly beautiful is what's inside of them. Are you humble? Are you loving? Are you respectful? Are you non-judgmental? These are the things that make you beautiful. When it comes down to it, everyone is created to be different and special in their own way. So whether you have blonde hair, freckles, green eyes, curly hair, a crooked nose, big ears, are humble, loving, caring, or respectful, you have to accept who you are and remember that the inside is what truly counts. Just think of it this way. The human race is a canvas and God is the artist, which now that I think about it, actually makes you a work of art. Thank you, Sophie. A little bit about Sophie. She loves to draw, play soccer, and volleyball. When Sophie grows up, she would like to become a veterinarian. Her favorite subject in school is language arts. Our fourth speaker is Jaden Ward from Rock Lake Middle School with How to Be a Best Friend. A best friend is like a pot of gold. You'll find one piece of gold out of 100 rocks, and that is like a best friend. How you know what a best friend is like is when they have your back, no matter what it is, or who it is. They would want to hang out with you all the time, no matter where it is. If it's to the park, to a restaurant, to a movie, mainly anywhere or everywhere. The last reason is, when you're down, they make you feel awesome and great. One of my closest friends is Matt DeLay. Even when I get on his nerves, he forgives me, and that is what a best friend does. One time, I caught Matt slipping. He had a crush on this girl, and he was flirting with her. After a million times I asked him, he finally told me who it was. I was really excited when he told me. But unfortunately, after a week or two, I was talking to some friends, and I said it. I, it, I basically shot my friendship with Matt. It came out my huge mouth. He was furious with me, but I couldn't be mad at him because if I was him, I would be mad too. Good for me, he forgave me after a week or two. And that's what a best friend does. He is a great person for doing that. I've been Matt's friend for, since the first quarter of middle school. The, dif the difference between a friend and a best friend is that a friend will tell you, what, will tell you whatever you want to know. A best friend tells you the full truth, no matter if it's good or bad. A best friend knows most of your secrets. They will tell you the embarrassing things about you, about them. And that's why you always need to keep your best friends close, because it's almost impossible to find another one. Thank you, Jaden. You're exactly right. Best friends are hard to find. And I'm sure that all 14 of you make excellent friends. Jaden plays slot receiver for the Lake Brantley Patriots. And I had to look that up. A slot receiver is a position on the field in football. So I learned something new there. <laughs> it might be common knowledge. I don't know. <laughs> Jaden also enjoys music. And he loves the Los Angeles Clippers basketball team. Our fifth speaker is Ashton Fields from Indian Trails Middle School with special needs.
What is a disability? It's a setback or a regression in life. We automatically make a generalization that people with disabilities are classified a level below us. But really, all of us have a disability of some sort. So why is it that my school doesn't let us have any interaction with the disabled kids? Every morning I come to school, the disabled kids are isolated in a corner by themselves, and people just stare at them, creating a negative image. To prevent this image, special needs students should be integrated into mainstream classrooms. My elementary school changed my life significantly by letting a kid with a disability into a classroom. Tyler had Down syndrome and was placed into the mainstream class next door to mine. One day during recess, Tyler looked me in the eye and said, want to be best friends? To this day, Tyler and I are companions who hang out on the weekends, go to places like Universal, and I even got him to follow my passion of basketball. I would have not made such a great friends if he wasn't allowed into the mainstream classes. Friendships of all kinds can blossom if he was allowed into the mainstream class. Another reason why special needs kids should be in some mainstream classes is that they can learn a lot better, especially from the help of their peers. Grades can improve and the overall attitude about school. Also, communication skills can vastly improve for special needs. If a kid with Down syndrome was surrounded with kids with miscellaneous disabilities, he would not learn as well as if he was around kids with better and sharper superior communication skills. It also triggers mainstream kids to be compassionate and helpful towards their peers. So, to sum it up, we often look at the differences between mainstream and disabled kids. Allowing kids into mainstream classes can help us look at the similarities. So whether it's Superman without his kryptonite, around kryptonite, whether it's Thor without his hammer, we can all make a change to society, and we can remember that we need to remember the similarities, not the differences, with people and kids with dis disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Ashton. We definitely have a group of children with big hearts, very compassionate. A little bit about Ashton. He's the starting point guard for the Indian Trails Middle School basketball team. Ashton is also first chair percussion in the Indian Trails Middle School band. And his favorite band is U2, and he's going to see them in concert this summer. Our sixth speaker is Amy from Jackson Heights Middle School with health benefits of laughter. Amy? Just a couple weeks ago, me and my best friend had one of the greatest laughs of my life. We were sitting in front of the bus, going home, and I started to tell her about an annoying boy from elementary school. I told her his name was Felipe, and she said his name is Toothpick. We both started busting our guts, laughing noxiously. Someone in the next row looked at us both like we'd lost our minds. Little did we know that that laugh actually made us live longer. Forget medicine, forget therapy, forget addicting drugs, laugh. Laughing can actually add years to your life. It's not just a myth. According to examiner.com, humor produces laughter. Laughter produces several positive effects on your physical, mental, and emotional state of well-being, such as making your blood vessels more elastic and resilient. It lowers blood pressure, boosts your immune system, triggers natural painkillers, reduces stress hormone levels, produces a general sense of well-being. If you laugh enough, it can even give you a six-pack. Why shouldn't you laugh? If you find something funny, really, truly laugh. There is a Loma Linda University study on a group of 60 to 70-year-olds who lost most of their memory. Half sat and did nothing, while the other half watched funny videos that made them laugh. The half that watched the funny, funny videos actually remembered more of their life after laughing. Watching funny videos for 15 minutes a day can actually improve your health by a lot. Or you can watch a hilarious movie. I recommend Mrs. Doubtfire. Remember a funny moment from your past. Surround yourself with people who love to laugh. Get a pet. They have lots of funny moments. A Yiddish proverb. What is soap to the body is laughter to the soul. A day without laughter is a day wasted. Charlie Chaplin. Laughter is an instant vacation. Milton Berle. Laughter heals all wounds, and it's the one thing that everybody shares. No matter what you're going through, it makes you forget about your problems. I think the world should keep laughing. Kevin Hart. Against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. Mark Twain. Laughing is the most amazing thing on earth, even better than chocolate.
Thank you, Amy. Amy is a thespian, which is another term for actor or actress originating from the Greek god Thespis, the traditional father of Greek tra tragedy. Amy loves the movie Up and the website Etsy, which has handcrafted goods. Our seventh speaker is Claire Fosber from Holy Cross Lutheran Academy with Feeling Left Out. Claire? Hello, my name is Claire, and I would like to ask you a few questions. Have you ever wished your friend would tell you that big secret, the one that everyone knows about but you? Have you ever felt like you didn't fit in because of constant teasing? Have you ever felt left out when you were not invited to a party that your friends were talking about? Well, let's all face the facts. Everyone, including the most popular, coolest, coolest, and smartest people feel left out at least once in their lifetime. But why do we feel left out? And how can the people who get lots of attention feel left out too? Let's find out. We all know about celebrities in music, movies, the arts, and sports. Everyone loves them. Celebrities must have been the most awesome kids in school, right? Think again. Did you know that pop singer Taylor Swift said this? I remember when I was in school, the whole reason I started writing songs was because I was alone a lot of the time. I'd sit there in school and be hearing people like, oh my gosh, this party that we're going to is going to be so awesome on Friday. Everyone's invited except for Taylor. I have another example for you. Actress Selena Gomez was quoted as saying that she was bullied every second of every day in elementary and middle school. Look at Taylor Swift and Selena Gomez now. They are well-known and confident young adults who have obviously overcome feeling left out. Both Taylor and Selena experienced extreme social pain, but they did not take revenge on the people who were hurting them. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Kids who are teased sometimes tease the people who are hurting them, kind of like the saying that goes, if you can't beat them, join them. They are likely teasing others because it's easier to tease than to be teased. There are lots of ways that we can feel left out. Whether we're teased or perhaps we want to know a secret that our friends are sharing. So what should we do when we feel left out? Here are some suggestions for you. First, focus on the people who don't intentionally hurt you or make fun of you. Second, remind yourself that you are perfect just the way you are. And third, remind yourself that God is with you, or trust that God is always with you and will take care of you. If you still feel left out, then the answer is in Taylor Swift's famous song, Shake It Off. Thank you, Claire. Claire enjoys writing and poetry, cooking, and plays the piano. As I mentioned before, we're at our halfway point. There will be a brief interme intermission once our final speaker goes. You'll have the chance to enjoy some Tropicana orange juice and cookies in the lobby, but I'll let you know when it's time. So moving, in, moving on, we have our eighth speaker, Shelby Brunson from Teague Middle School with Proud to be a Girl. I see sports. I see girls achieving A's. I see smart career choices and girls standing proudly, proudly next to all of them. Not only do girls have the power to stand up in a male-dominated world, girls are changing our society every day in sports, academia, and careers, just like a girl. Are you tired of being told you play like a girl 
throw like a girl and pitch like a girl, I know for a fact I am. We are not defined by our gender, but rather by our values and how we conduct ourselves. We must believe in ourselves and recognize stereotypes in the making. Stereotypes can shake our confidence, leading us to believe we're not as intelligent, as fast, as athletic, and as strong. Here's a news flash. We have the power to succeed, just as any boy. We're not as good in math and science. Let me tell you something. This is a filthy deception. Though boys have always led the way in math and science, girls are aggressively closing that gap, noted Richard Whitmire and Susan Bailey in Education Next. There will always be obstacles in our path, but when we have the grades, it will all fall in place. We must study, focus in class, and not be afraid to seek help and ask questions. That's how we grow in education. Mae Jameson, astronaut, Maya Angelou, author, Mary Curie, physicist, these bold women dared to tear down the doors that only men held the keys to. Today, girls can choose any career path, but we can't take the easy way out. Let's leave that to the guys. There will be challenges as society changes. We must do the work and support each other to overcome all of the hurdles. Girls will be a force to be reckoned with. As J.K. Rowling said, anything is possible if you got enough nerve. And yes, we do throw like girls because we are girls. So the next time a boy says you throw like a girl, say thank you. We are empowered. Proud to be a girl. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Shelby plays basketball, enjoys fiction books on Greeks, and has a dog named Teddy. I don't know about you, but I can see many of our 14 finalists up in Washington, D.C. in the coming years. We'll move on to our ninth speaker, Cameron Kelly from Altamont Christian School with The Forgetfulness. I looked in her eyes. Those same eyes used to sparkle with love, kindness, and beauty. <clears throat> they look dull now and joyless. I tried to have a conversation with her. I say, I love you, Nana. And though she tried so hard to tell me the same, the words came out in a jumbled mess. Statistically speaking, by the time I'm done talking with you, three people will have developed Alzheimer's. There are approximately 500,000 deaths per year because of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a dreadful disease with history, facts, and effects that will leave you awestruck. There have been many different records of unexplained memory loss in the past. In 1906, a man named Dr. Elios Alzheimer identified a certain type of brain cell abnormality found in people who are suffering from the, this strange form of forgetfulness. By 1960, the medical community had officially recognized this forgetfulness as a disease instead of just a natural part of the aging process. Since the 1960s, Alzheimer's disease has become an American plague. Researchers believe there may be a cure in as few as five to 10 years from now. But if that doesn't happen by the year of 2050, 13 million Americans will be living with Alzheimer's disease. The latest research reports that Alzheimer's kills more people than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. Women in their 60s are two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's than men the same age. In fact, two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. Women are the epicenter of Alzheimer's. 
89 people develop Alzheimer's every hour. After the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, a patient has an approximate four to eight more years to live. There are seven stages of Alzheimer's. The first stage, people generally notice very little differences in brain function, but it's there, taking up residence in that person's brain. The second stage, there are minor differences, but no symptoms. In the third stage, they start showing symptoms, but not all are diagnosed. In the fourth stage, there are some clear-cut symptoms, and they start experiencing forgetfulness. In the fifth stage, they will have memory lapses and start forgetting recent conversations. By the sixth stage, their personality changes, and from here on, their memory just worsens. The seventh stage is the last stage. They will lose the ability to respond to their envir environment and may only say words or phrases. I tell you this not to sadden you, but to inform you of the history, facts, and effects of Alzheimer's. Many of you, like me, love somebody who has Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is worse than cancer. Cancer has survivors. No one survives Alzheimer's. Thank you, Cameron. That is a very important topic. And it's a great reminder to enjoy the time that we have with one another and our loved ones. A little bit about Cameron, she's a bookworm. She plays basketball at Altamont Christian and she loves shoes, which we can tell by her hot pink sneakers. Our 10th speaker is Laurel Pursley from the Master's Academy with My Annoying Sisters. I once heard a quote that stated, a sister is a gift to the heart, a friend to the spirit, and a golden thread to the meaning of life. When I read that, I thought to myself, she obviously didn't have the sisters I have. I have three of them, and none of them are a gift to my heart. My youngest sister, Kate, is seven. My middle sister, Olivia, is 10, and my oldest sister, Madeline, is 17. They all have a tendency to drive me in crazy, but in the end, I love each of them. Sisters sure can be annoying, but and because I have so many of them, I will tell you how they get on my nerves. Once, my seven-year-old sister went into my closet and started messing with all my stuff. She rearranged my clothes, and when I had to get ready for church in the morning, I had a hard time finding my shoes that she hid under my bed. My 10-year-old sister will fre frequently will barge into my room looking for books and other items that she claimed she has to have sit for school the next day. My 17-year-old sister will always bosses me around all the time and gives me one task after another to do whenever she is around. My youngest sisters will scream and cry for no good reason at all, and often in the morning I wake up to them yelling and playing. They always seem to get me in trouble for something that I didn't even do, and they seem to be a lot noisier than my friend's sisters. The worst is when they spill something and make a great big mess that I end up having to clean up. I think my sisters purposely try to drive me crazy. I'll, even though my sisters scream, cry, and boss me around, I find it annoying, but I, there are times when I'm glad to have them. For instance, my older sister helps me out with homework, drives me to school in the morning, and lets me borrow her clothes sometimes. My other sisters always keep me busy, whether it's playing board games inside or riding our bicycles outside. They frequently keep me entertained by running around and doing fashion shows or homemade skits for me. Although my sisters can be annoying, I still love them. Like Elsa and Anna, sisters are forever. Thank you, Laurel. I agree, sisters are very important. Laurel likes to read. Her favorite sport is volleyball, and English is her favorite subject in school. Before we move on to our 11th speaker, we have summer camp, 4-H summer camp that is coming up this July. The first place winner of the competition not only receives an amazing plaque, but they get a full scholarship to 4-H summer camp, which is an excellent time in the Ocala National Forest where they get to enjoy archery, canoeing, kayaking, everything you could possibly imagine. Our 11th speaker is Eli Garman from Middle, um, Millwee Middle School with My Family Adoption. So this month was my brother's gotcha day. For those of you who don't know, 
Agata Day is the celebration of when you have had an adoption. An adoption is when somebody legally joins your family. My family braved the adventure of adoption one year ago. It all started in October of 2010. However, my sister and I did not find out until seven months later. We learned a lot about patients while wait, waiting two more years. It was exciting when we fi finally matched with Micah in October of 2013. Then we waited again until February of 2014 to meet my brother for the first time in Seoul, South Korea. We only had to wait two more months for him to become part of our family. My sister and I were thrilled to go on the first trip to South Korea. It was our first, the first time seeing my brother Micah. His Korean name is Gundo, so we made that his middle name. We also explored Seoul, which was the city he lived in before we adopted him. We tried lots of new foods and learned about his ancestor's culture. On the second trip, my parents went alone and came back with my new one-year-old brother, Micah Gundo Garman. My family has had many hard times since Micah came. We have also had lots of fun. There were lots of sleepless nights at first, first but I've, there's also been lots of fun and have fun having a great, funny little brother. For his gotcha day, we went to a Korean restaurant called the Korean House. He had the time of his life and ate everything in sight. Through my family's adoption adventure, we have learned about patience, different culture, and best of all, we now have a new family member. We hope to have great time with my new brother, Micah. I hope he grows up to be as strong as his EI. Thank you, Eli. Eli designs video games. He loves pickles and Marvel superhero movies. I don't know if Eli knows this or not, but designing video games actually requires the skill of computer programming in designing video games and animation. And Seminole County 4-H actually has their very own computer science program that will be beginning this summer. Moving on to our 12th speaker, Clarissa, from Double R Private School with Ready for Inspection. Attention. This is what every cadet hears before inspection. I'm going to tell you how to get a military battle dress uniform ready for inspection. Inspections may sound scary, but they really aren't. All an inspection is, well, an inspection is where a high official goes around to each person in a large group and makes sure that every cadet has their uniform tidy and clean. The first thing you would need to do to your uniform is starch it. Now, I use liquid starch, and it's hard to find, so you might want to get a different type of starch. After that, you would have to fill a bucket full of water and pour in some starch. Then I carefully dip my pants and blouse into the starch water. You might be a little confused because I said blouse. Blouse is just another word for jacket or shirt. A few minutes later, you would need to take your uniform out of the starch water and put it in the washer. No need for soap this time. Set the washer on rinse and spin. This is to get the excess water and starch off. Once it's done in the washer, you'd have to put it in the dryer. And once it's nice and dry, you take it out of the dryer and put the uniform on two separate hangers. And you'd leave the uniform on there for about 30 minutes. After 30 minutes is up, you can take the pants off one of the ironing board, off the hanger, and put it on the ironing board. And be careful with an iron. Have a parent or guardian with you if you're young or inexperienced with some electrical appliances. 
And your uniform needs to be flat, or else you may get creases in it. And you don't want creases in your uniform. And once you're done with the pants, you have to move on to the blouse. And the blouse is harder to do than the pants because it has more curves, edges, and pockets you need to flatten out. And you don't want to melt the buttons. So on my iron, there's a special place for the buttons between the bottom of the iron and where the iron holds water. And once you're done with the blouse, you'd have to move on to the boots. And I use Lincoln shoe polish to polish my boots. My dad recommended this for me. And I trust his recommendation because he had lots of experience polishing and shining boots when he was in the military. And you'd need to have patience because trying to make your boots super shiny takes time. And this is how you can make your uniform ready for inspection. Thank you, Clarissa. I thought I was doing a great job with my laundry with just washing and ironing it. <laughs> Clarissa has been playing the piano for five years. Her pet's name is Mally, and her favorite TV show is UGO. We'll move on to our 13th speaker, Dylan Bartley from South Seminole Middle School with Different. Different, a word that can be used as an expression of uniqueness or as a subtle insult. People with Asperger's syndrome are normally labeled as the negative meaning of different, but differences, whether extreme or almost unnoticeable, shouldn't determine how we fit into society or how society treats us. Asperger's syndrome is a diagnosed disorder on the autism spectrum originally described by Hans Asperger. His explanation included problems with social interaction and communication specific or unwavering, sometimes unusual patterns of interest, and a delayed development in motor skills. Some children with Asperger's don't pick up on social clues, such as facial expressions or body language. Because of this, they may continue on a single topic that interests them for a prolonged period, not realizing that the other person is bored or uncomfortable. They may also have slightly one-sided conversations or tendency to talk about themselves rather than others. Anybody with autism might stand out in a crowd but what's on the outside doesn't always reflect what's on the inside. Kids with Asperger's are known to excel in school and be extremely intelligent, but have one or two subjects that they struggle in. For example, they may have straight A's in science, history, and music because they are very interested in those subjects, but have a B- in math, partially because they struggle in it, but also because they find the class boring and a little bit pointless. Kids with autism normally have very straightforward fields of interest, such as bulldogs or the Civil War. If they like something, they tend to know a lot about it. And if they dislike something, they really don't like it. <laughs> Lots of autistic children are very picky about textures of objects or noises. Some don't like to be touched. Others don't eat certain foods because of how it feels in their mouth. Regardless, they probably enjoy having something a certain way so that they can better understand or avoid the situation. My best friend Maz suffers from mild Asperger syndrome, but we're practically sisters. She loves cats, dragons, science, history, and lots of things that end with ology. Zoology, mythology, biology, and astrology. She has a great sense of humor, and I know what she likes and what she doesn't. She doesn't eat lots of things, but she loves chocolate chip cookies. And nature is practically her sanctuary. Spending time with her means spending most of the time outside, unless we're playing a spaceship game or Minecraft. She's also one of a kind and basically amazing. If you know someone with an autism spectrum disorder, whether it's a relative, a classmate, or a friend, keep in mind that, yes, they are different, but so are you, and the guy sitting next to you, and everyone else. Use those differences to unite us, not separate us, and the world would be a much better place. Thank you, Dylan. Dylan would like to go to Harvard for college. Her favorite band is Panic at the Disco, and her favorite book is The Fault in Our Stars. Well, Dylan will have to make sure to bring her friend a chocolate chip cookie, since that's her favorite. Last but not least, 
Our final speaker, our 14th speaker, is Pranav Swami Nathan from Stanford Middle School with Being a Gentleman. Boom! Everyone, when was the last time you saw a true gentleman? A gentleman is like an endangered species that's becoming extinct. We need to save them. Hi, and today, the three main points I'm going to be talking about are what makes a gentleman and what do they do, what do non-gentlemen do, and the benefits you get from being a gentleman. So to make a gentleman, there are certain etiquettes he follows. One, he has excellent manners and he's very humble and polite. Two, he gives a firm handshake, but not so tight, you're gonna be strangled. And he looks people in the eye when he's speaking. And number three, he has a very good sportsmanship and he's a great friend. Now you might be asking, what does a non-gentleman do? A non-gentleman does the exact opposite. He follows no etiquette whatsoever and he steals other gentlemen's girlfriend. <laughs> he has very bad sportsmanship and he is not a good friend a person that you would not want to be with. And boom, you're at the door, ladies. But wait, someone just slammed the door on you. How rude. That's an example of a non-gentleman. Now, the benefits you get of being a gentleman are you get invited to social conferences, you get better jobs, and remember, respect is not a gift. You have to earn it. By being a gentleman, I earn respect. Here's a real life example. Last week when I was at rehearsal, I was, op I was holding the door for a lady and she asked, are you the one that's gonna talk about being a gentleman? Wow, by being a gentleman, I earn respect. And also, don't remember guys, you get to hang out with the hot ladies. <laughs> so guys, remember the 4-H? A gentleman has great health, he has a good heart, he uses his clear thinking head, and he, has, he uses his hand for service. So, as you see, being a gentleman has a plenty amount of benefits. So, do you want to be the same old, lame old, mediocre person that is sitting there and listening to me right now? Or do you want to break that shell, go beyond the level, and be a true gentleman? I live as a gentleman. Being a gentleman is a commitment. Are you up to it? Thank you, Pranav. Pranav has been singing since he was three years old. He plays badminton and is very nice and outgoing, as we can tell. That concludes our speeches. Okay, in just one moment, I'm gonna have each of the 14 finalists come up to receive a recognition pin. I will then announce the four winners. Okay. If I could please have Shreya come on up to receive your recognition pin. Awesome. Tally Chamberlain, come on up. Sophie Golka. Jaden Ward. Ashton Fields, Amy Yokum, Amy Joac Joachim. I knew I would get it wrong. <laughs> Next, we have Claire Fosber. Shelby Brunson. Cameron Kelly. Thank you. 
Laurel Persley. Eli Garman. Clarissa Avila. Dylan Bartley. And Pranav Swami Nathan. I will now announce our finalists, beginning with honorable mention, family and friends. I will give you the OK sign when you can come up to take pictures. So if you could please wait until I let you know the right time. I must say, a little bit of anticipation here, but all of the 14 finalists did an amazing job, and they should all be very proud of themselves. Our fourth place honorable mention is Dylan Bartley. <laughs> Our third place winner is Shelby Brunson. Our second place winner is Claire Fosber. <laughs> and our first place winner, countywide winner of the Seminole County 4-H Tropicana Public Speaking Competition, who gets a full scholarship to 4-H summer camp is Pranav Swami Nathan. <laughs> Another big round of applause for our four finalists. Everyone should be very, very proud of themselves. Another round of applause for doing an excellent job. Thank you.